What's up guys? This is a demo of um, how to read a force time curve on a counter movement chomp. Um, so how do you get it to the screen here? Um, first you go over here to the, the menu bar on the left side. Go down to manage. Come up here and, and type in your athlete's name. Um, your attempts will load down here. Um, we'll go ahead and select one ten attempt. And it'll populate our jump here real quick. All right, so on the left-hand screen here, we have all the metrics um, that we calculate from this attempt. This is 77 metrics here. Um, obviously, for our system, we have everything shown, but if you are a user, you probably want to narrow this list down. Um, generally, don't suggest anything more than 15, uh, usually closer to like 7 to start. Um, kind of get an idea of what you're doing first. Over here, we have a key metric. Um, you can change this in the settings. Uh, this is usually jump height, uh, modified RSI, RSI, uh, jump momentum, uh, whatever you want to make it. And then right here you can compare uh, whatever your comparison. This will change here. So this will be the 10 sessions, 5 sessions, and then uh, last and last 20 sessions. All right, so finally we work our way up here to the force time curve um, and what this video is about. Um, I'll kind of just talk about where the athlete is on the jump um, during this curve. So we have Newtons on the left here and time on the bottom. Um, so this, uh, what color is it here? This navy blue line is going to be the total force that the athlete is uh, producing throughout this entire counter movement jump. Um, these two lines here this lighter one would be the left force and then this purplish color is the right force um, so as you can see it's pretty easy to see the discrepancy between the limbs here along the curve and you can visually see at what parts do they have a bigger discrepancy um, it's kind of interesting here it, it kind of switches dominance here as you get to the bottom of that on waiting um, next we'll kind of dive into the colors so this yellow color here um, this would be a, a negative impulse because it is below this line. Um, this line here indicates uh, system weight, and that is uh, the newtons that force plate is uh, measuring in that, that weighing period. So basically we take this first one second period, um, and our system makes you stand still for one second or else it doesn't pick this up. It says failed attempt. It takes this one second and then it draws it all the way out. You can see this is a nice smooth line. Um, that's how much the athlete weighs. So for me over here on the left, my system weight is 836. Um, you can multiply that by 0.22 and that'll give you um, how much I, I weigh in pounds, which would be about 185. Um, so that's how much the athlete weighs. From here, we have a threshold of uh, minus 5 standard deviations from the system weight. So as soon as that threshold is met, that initiates uh, this color here to, to turn yellow and their negative impulse or unweighting happens. I like to talk about this phase as a free fall phase. So the athlete is weighing less um, in the in system, like it's, it is weighing less than how much they weigh during this, this weighing period here. So you can think of it as they're essentially free falling um, to the ground at this point. Um, gravity is pushing them down here. But as soon as they get to the bottom here, um, they're hitting their feet quick they, they really truthfully never leave the force plate like a true drop catch but uh, you get the idea so now they're they're actively applying force at the bottom of this unweighting period about right here in the middle um, now as soon as they start pushing in um, they're still moving down in the jump visually so if you're looking um, they're not at the lowest position yet but force is rising so here they're pushing into the ground, pushing into the ground. When they get above system weight, which is that line, that's when it becomes the breaking phase. And that's when we start uh, making this red here. So we don't call this eccentric phase because um, there's both concentric and eccentric action, muscle action still happening here um, during this breaking phase. All right, so we're at the breaking phase. Force is still rising, but we're not at the low position of that jump yet until we get to this point right here. Uh, we don't really call this anything, but I like to, to talk about it as like that transition point. Um, you could think of it as the amortization period. Um, if you're familiar with like triphasic concepts and the V that 
that Cal talks about, um, the bottom of that V would be this position right here um, in the jump when velocity is zero at the top here. Um, in our system, the metric that we use to identify this is force at minimum displacement. Um, and that is the lowest position of the counter movement jump. So if you're looking at, at this attempt visually, that's the low bottom position of the, the counter movement. And then this propulsive period here happens uh, rather quickly. Um, for some, it, it extends out long. For some, it's just a nice U. Um, you also see one peak and then another double peak here. You can also see force kind of stagnant out here, spend a little longer, and then spike again. Um, this green is the propulsive side. So some call that the concentric phase, but then again, there's both eccentric and concentric actions happening during this phase. Um, so research standard is to call it the propulsive phase. Um, you might also see propulsion used in literature uh, to describe this phase. So this green area here, um, when you multiply the force of this period here by the time, this is when you get impulse. Um, if you're, so if someone says propulsive impulse, um, if they say propulsive net impulse, that would mean over the system weight right here. If they're just saying propulsive impulse, then they would include this little sliver here. This area is added onto that to get propulsive impulse. Uh, what we like to use is propulsive net impulse because ultimately the propulsive net impulse of this um, it, it basically the propulsive area, which is propulsive net impulse here, would dictate the velocity that the athlete leaves the plate with right here, right before force gets back down to zero. Um, you'll see a little bump here. That's just with force uh, platforms. You'll see this little itty bitty spike. That's just the force plates um, bouncing at the ground um, when the athlete leaves the plates, and we account for this um, in our calculations. So anyway, back to propulsive net impulse, uh, that dictates movement and it dictates the velocity that the athlete's going to leave the force plate with. Um, takeoff velocity, so the, how fast they're leaving the plate with, dictates the jump height because it is included in the calculation. Um, there's a few different ways to calculate jump height. Uh, the gold standard way is to calculate it from takeoff velocity. But you can also calculate it from flight time. I um, think there's an impulse equation out there. So there are different nuances that researchers have developed, but the best way is to use takeoff velocity. Um, that is the gold standard, so that's what we use. Um, here, as soon as force gets to zero, we enter the flight phase, which is basically just this big open area here in the middle of the curve. Um, so you can see the flight time here is 2.75 all the way to 3, 4. Um, so you can just subtract that minus this, and you get the time in air or the flight time. As soon as force gets above zero, right here, um, this is the initial landing as soon as those feet touch the ground. Um, you'll usually see like a, a little bit of a spike first, and then you'll see like a real big spike in peak force upon landing. Um, as you can see here, this athlete doesn't have too big of a, a peak force relative to their system weight. Um, it's at 3,000 newtons. Um, usually I like to look at peak relative landing force here. Um, anything above 450% is usually a red flag that tells me, hey, maybe we should teach this athlete to land or kind of just maybe cue um, to land a little softer. Um, especially if you're getting a new athlete coming in, that's something good to check real quick and see where they're at with this value. Um, I really don't love to look at many other landing metrics. Um, that's why we really haven't identified much in this phase because it's super variable um, depending on coaching instruction on how to land and also athlete to athlete um, day to day. But basically, this is this is the landing phase here, and as soon as it starts getting back to system weight, um, you could get a stabilization period here. But you would really want the athlete to, to land and stay down in the, that squat low squat position, uh, and, and then tailor back out into system weight to get a, a good value for time stabilization. Um, you know, in a research setting, that that might be something that's pretty feasible. But in an applied setting, when you're trying to get athletes in and out and off the force plates quick and get the other one up, it's kind of tough to get them to stay on. More often than not, you'll have the athlete just jump off here. Um, as soon as they as soon as they land, they kind of just step right off and then the test will end. Um, hopefully that helps you kind of get an idea of kind of move the jump force time curve. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us at Hawk and Dynamics.
Um, you can also email, send me an email directly at drake at hawkandynamics.com.